Greetings. Join me again as we um, listen and uh, hear very carefully what Jesus had to say when he when he uses this "I am seven as I am saying" in John's Gospel, chapter seven. I want to read this passage with you, and uh, so come with me now, and uh, let's, as if it were, sit at the feet of Jesus and uh, hear him, hear him speak. And let's take a look at what was going on back in his day so that we can get a glimpse of, uh, of the full story. It's awesome. In John uh, chapter 7, verse 28, I read, Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more, miracle, m more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time. Then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go? That we cannot find him. Will he go where our people live? scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, for where I am, you cannot come. Now here's the story and the backdrop of all of this that is absolutely fascinating. Verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And then John adds this comment. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. So today I want for us to think together about the source of joy overflowing or overflowing joy. It's absolutely fascinating to take a look at this. <clears throat> what I find here is that um, there are several feasts, of course, you know, there are seven feasts that uh, God had commanded through Moses and uh, then there were three that were added later. So today there are 10 uh, Jewish feasts in the year. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> and it's in the fall of the year after harvest. It actually commemorates the uh, time that the Jews were in the Exodus, moving from Egypt to the Promised Land and, and 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And so they built uh, what we call tabernacles or makeshift tents of various kinds. And they sleep outdoors in under these tents to celebrate this wonderful time. Even to this day, they do. But back then, what happened is in this eight-day feast, is each morning of the of the time of the feast, uh, the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam. They would lead a procession along the way, and they would go out through the water gate in Jerusalem. In the picture that I have on the slide here. I want you to see that some, uh, somewhere out here on the south side of the temple gate that Jesus is speaking. And uh, the procession takes place and then they, they gather and go down to the Pool of Siloam and they come back probably along this new uh, pilgrim path that they have recently discovered archaeologically. So they go down to the pool of Siloam, and uh, Isaiah had a thing that he prophesied back in uh, 500 and some years before Christ. And there's a verse, ch chapter 12, verse 3, With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. 
And we wonder, well, what did he mean by that? But you know, God had a purpose in all that, and he was illustrating things all the way through the Old Testament and predicting what was to come. So the, the priest would go down to the pool of salvation of Siloam, and they would dip their pitchers into the, into the pool, and they would bring water. Uh, actually, the, it was only the high priest that did it every, every day. Uh, of the seven days, the eighth day, all the priests. Then they come up this pilgrim path and they come into the temple area and they would come to the uh, brazen altar, the altar of sacrifices, that great altar of burnt offerings. And here the high priest would pour his water through a silver spout onto the altar. This was a libation to the Lord. This was in honor of him and uh, in illustrating something they knew not what, but it symbolized God's gift of water in the desert after they quarreled with Moses. The children of Israel had run out of water, and water is a major, major thing, and it's absolutely necessary for everything that's happening in the desert. Um, <clears throat> they quarreled and they said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? But it's more than just a moment and an event that happened. You see, Isaiah says that God uses water as a symbol of something as a symbol of life and a symbol of joy. So Isaiah says, For I will pour out water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offering, offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So on that last and greatest day of the, um, of the feast, there's, there is a shift that takes place that's absolutely awesome. What happens is that the high priest goes down and gets his pitcher, and all of the priests follow him down to the pool of Siloam, and they all, all the priests, fill their pitchers with water, and they walk back up through this uh, pilgrim path, and uh, they come into the temple area, and come up to the great altar, and the high priest then pours his pitcher of water, and all the priests pour their pitchers at the same time. And uh, they, they use great basins of water that they had stored. And water just flows everywhere on this occasion. Now, <clears throat> Jesus stood and cried at that very moment in the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles and all of the pomp and ceremony going on. If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Wow, what a beautiful picture. We're told the meaning. In John chapter 7, John, John uh, concludes this little segment by saying, By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the, uh, <clears throat> the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Wow, what a story. Listen, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, <clears throat> in all of life, ever since the day of Adam, but particularly it's evident in our day and our culture today, joy, this essential of life, is extremely scarce. It's a simple story. It flows through the Bible. Man, man once had joy back in the Garden of Eden, but it was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. Now then, the story is that nothing but the fullness of God can restore the joy that man craves. So here we are with the story. And um, God offers overflowing joy. But joy is the product of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
and God is the one who offers it. And it's only available after the resurrection of Jesus and after the day of Pentecost. Originally, man had enjoyed joy overflowing, but always in relationship to the living, loving God. And the blessing flowed out of the harmony that man had with his creator, a harmony of fellowship and of obedience. We, we get a glimpse of this, actually, um, through the Bible stories. We read, we see it with some of the Bible heroes. They were filled with the Spirit. There are biblical events that depict this and foretell it and illustrate it so beautifully. And so all the way through the Bible down to the New Testament, God is telling us that he will again restore what was lost. Through his prophets, God promised a mighty outpouring of his spirit. In Isaiah 43, for instance, he said, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. In Jeremiah, the prophet, we read, I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord. And then, of course, we have uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, where we read, And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. There's an outpouring of God's spirit that is available since Jesus made it possible by his atoning work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and the fulfillment of God's promise on the day of Pentecost that personally satisfies. It absolutely fills us and joy flows. And it does so in endless supply. After all, God is infinite. So Jesus says, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There are three requisites that are focused then out of this picture that God gives us and what Jesus says there. And I want to just go through these with you for a little bit. First of all, there is faith. There always has to be faith. Grace is an offer God makes. There has to be faith is, is the receiving of this. So we must believe in Jesus. Jesus says, whoever believes in me. And then there needs to be experience. Somewhere there needs to be the evidence of the reality of the overflowing joy resulting from the gift of God's spirit in our heart and in our life. You know, there are a lot of people that are trying to be Christians on their own effort, but they don't have what God intended us to have. And so it's hard and harsh sometimes. And, and they react and, and not always Christ-like, but God can give us an experience that is real and wonderful. And Jesus says, streams of living water, living water will flow from within him. Wow, what a privilege. Now, in addition to that, there had to be exaltation. In other words, Jesus had to be glorified. Up to that time, we read, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You see, he so often try a lot of different ways to find joy and have it. Like back there, fancy pictures of different kinds. We try ancient wells and even elaborate rituals. But the truth is, Jesus came so that we could have overflowing joy. That's what it's all about. We find it in him. I want to tell you, get it. At all costs, get it. Stay in his presence, ask him for it, receive it, and then share it freely. There's a dying world out there 
desperate for the joy that God wants to give us. And you and I know the secret. And we can have it in abundance. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Well, listen. <clears throat> I'd like for you to, to pray with me for a little bit. And if you haven't received this gift from the Father, receive it now. Father, you have illustrated and you have spoken and you've promised and you've fulfilled all of that. And here we are. Some of us today may need a bucket of joy, something that really satisfies, something that is eternal and everlasting. Fill us with your spirit today, I ask. Give us this water that gushes from within us and then help us to splash it and share it freely with everyone. And I thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.